There we go. Well, they want it for the video. Right. Low right. audience at home. Um, boy. Welcome to the uh, Apply, Rinse, Repeat, Get Location Agnostic session. Uh, thank you for joining us at the last session. Um, we are we're going to be we can be flexible with this. I think we're tweaking a little bit of what the content is. We'll go through exactly what that those changes are, but the focus is going to be on uh, building physical infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, container infrastructure, and uniting it with uh, uh, so software-defined networking. So, big topic, a lot of things. Absolutely. My name is Rob Hirschfeld. I'm on the OpenStack Foundation board. Uh, I'm also CEO and co-founder of a company called Rack N, uh, and we focus on physical infrastructure automation, so big scale automation. Um, you might know me, I used to be at Dell, um, and I'm the founder of the Crowbar Project, and we'll talk about that. Um, and uh, I'm on Zeehicle online and on IRC, so if you, you might see me that way also. So I'm Parantap Lahiri, I work for Juniper Networks. Uh, specifically, I take care of the solution engineering team for Contrail. And as a part of that role, I engage with customers in their hybrid cloud as well as on-premises cloud deployment. Uh, from a background point of view, I used to work for Windows Azure in Microsoft Online Services. And before that, I was part of UNet Network Engineering. So just before we dive in, how many people are familiar with Contrail? Open Contrail? Not that many. Okay, <laughs> so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so and. And then, how many people have deployed OpenStack? Is that a, that's good, okay. And how many people are familiar with uh, Kubernetes and how that works? Okay, oh, so we'll, nice. it just, if you want to ask questions about how those things work, ask questions about how those things work. We have backup material for it. Um, and we're gonna, we'll talk through, through those things. This is the last session, so we can be casual. <laughs> um, and we're, we're here to talk about uh, two technology sets that are adjacencies to uh, the OpenStack project. Neither of them are OpenStack projects, per se, but they are both in and around the ecosystem quite a bit. One is Digital Rebar, um, which is the rebranding of the Open Crowbar project. Um, it's really V3 of Open Crowbar, if you're, if you're used to that. Um, and it's, it's providing a complete provisioning system going all the way from physical infrastructure out of the box, all the way through building a Kubernetes uh, type infrastructure. And then recently we've been changing it to make it so that it can run not just physical, but cloud infrastructure also. So you can do a Kubernetes deploy against an OpenStack cluster, and we'll talk about that. So uh, we are going to talk about open control today. Uh, as you, some of you might know already that it's a virtual overlay network system which uh, goes beyond a single orchestration system. So you can have um, OpenStack as well as Kubernetes as well as VMware and you can have any orchestration system spawning either container, VM or uh, even bare metal and open control can tie them together in a single virtual network. Uh, specifically, uh, you can also do policy between those virtual network and every container or VM gets its own specific IP. So essentially, the virtual networking needs are all solved by Contrail. So we are going to talk uh, today about how Digital Rebar and Open Contrail works together. And, and what I'm really excited about in, in the combination here is that we're really talking about building end-to-end -end infrastructure. Right, making cloud infrastructure truly agnostic. And that's a lot of what, what we see in market, what we see people wanting to try and do. They don't want to be locked in, right? OpenStack's very much about not having lock-in, but that lock-in extends to other cloud infrastructures like Amazon, Azure, Google, VMware, where people want to be able to create portability between those infrastructures. So we want hybrid clouds. Um, and as anybody who's been in industry knows, that's really, really hard. Um, we need open platforms, we have those. We need distributed overlay networking, we have that. We have consistent scale operations, we've got that. Um, and one of the things that we need to be able to do to pull all this together is learn faster, right? These are complex infrastructures. It's been really hard. It's, this is a, this, you know, a very simple description just showing the layers, right? It's from metal, your first network, your cloud network, your container network, your container infrastructure, and we haven't even gotten to your own application yet. So it's a lot of stacks, a lot of things that have to work together, a lot of pieces that have to fit, and then you multiply this across 100 nodes or 1,000 nodes. Yep. 
It's a big deal. And so when we look at the their infrastructure needs, what we're saying is that you really are looking at heterogeneous infrastructure, right? The reason we're on stage together is that you might say, well, I just want to run metal, put uh, SSDN on top of that, and then run my application on metal, right? That we can do. Yep. You might want to do uh, metal, put in uh, SDN networking and, and Kubernetes, and then you might want to then build a whole stack. You might want to say, well, I'm going to do Open, open stack with software defined networking in Neutron, and then on top of that, build Kubernetes and app. And why would you want to do all three of those things? What you're trying to do is to create a consistent networking topology, right? So you want your application to be able to mix and match different types of infrastructure together. So your Kubernetes application might be able to talk to a Cassandra database or a Hadoop database that's running on metal, and then still have a single network unified. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what we see is uh, people want to consume services which is running in a traditional Oracle database or in an Oracle bare metal, and it only exposes a single IP endpoint, which may be an application that it is written on Kubernetes wants to access, and they want to put it in a single virtual network. So all those kind of use cases get enabled in this approach. So if you can do all these things, then you've created a a private infrastructure, right? So the difference between this previous slide, this is working in your own infrastructure where you're, you own the metal, but here we're talking about something that where you're mixing and matching not just different types of infrastructure that you own, but different types of infrastructure that you might access without owning it. So public clouds from that, that case. Because do you want to talk about some of the capabilities and how, oh. how you actually unify this type of network? Right, right, absolutely. So essentially what you see here is there is an on-premise network which could be having one infrastructure as a service oh. layer which exposes all the VMs. It's actually, there you go. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, this is a good one. So if you look at this particular slide on the left-hand side, you see the on-premises private network which has a physical underlay. Then you can have an infrastructure as a service layer which gives you VMs and be it spawned by uh, VMware on ESXi or OpenStack on KVM. And then on the top of it, you have containers that are, are pods that are sitting inside those VMs. So those pods might be in its own virtual network. Now, if you look at the true networking need that pans across public as well as on-premises cloud, it actually connects in each of these three layers. And the first underlay could be a direct connection like you have Amazon uh, Direct Connect, and I think uh, Express Connect is there from Azure. Or you can do it over internet, and then you need an IPsec tunnel to connect the VPC in AWS with your on-premises uh, uh, network. And then you have the public cloud, which runs the Kubernetes clusters inside it. And that has its own network, which has to extend to the pr private premises. So that is the complexity we are talking about here. And we do have technology uh, which does this. But the packaging part and how do you, and that's the digital rebar comes in where you can rinse and repeat the whole infrastructure. So does this make sense? So, you know, if things can communicate, that doesn't always right. mean that the applications see it as a unified network. So when you're building an application that spans clouds, you need yep. it to look like a unified network. You need your routing, you need load balancing, you need, you know, different ways to approach the technology that don't present it as three completely segmented networks. Exactly, exactly. And so one of the reasons this is so hard is there's just a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of configuration that you have to get exactly right. There's a lot of learning that you have to do. You have to account for you know, cloud infrastructures and physical infrastructures. Uh, and w we've been talking about something called the fidelity gap. So fidelity in this case means that each one of these environments is so different that when you learn something in one, say a development environment, the learnings from that don't translate into the next environment. So if you go, if you've got it working in dev stack, then that, that does not translate at all into your test environment. That doesn't translate into proof of concept. That certainly doesn't translate into production. And those gaps cost a lot of time. They cost a lot of money. And, and what they're doing is they're breaking automation. So when you try to move between these different infrastructures from your desktop to an internal cloud to a public cloud, those steps end up costing you a lot of time. They end up costing you a lot of communications gaps, right? If the tester finds something that broke, the developer doesn't have a good way to replicate that and fix that bug in the future, right? Those, that's, what, that's what we're talking about with this. And then it's even worse. Fidelity gap, with, you know, in this graph, it's traditionally saying, oh, this is just a single path through. 
But if I'm building a hybrid architecture, then I actually have a fidelity gap between my physical deployment and my cloud deployment. And now I'm going to constantly struggle with my deployment because I'm literally sitting in two completely different environments that don't have fidelity. Okay. So our goal here is to address the fidelity gap by creating a smoother way to do automation between them, right? Faithful operations in every environment, physical, virtual, desktop. Um, and then that would translate into a faster and faster um, deployment cycle. So this is one of the things that we think is really important is that if you want to do this type of complex environment, you know, we're not trying to hide that it's, mm -hmm. you know, that we've, we've gotten a big easy button that's going to deploy heterogeneous clouds and distributed architectures and build software to find networks between them. Yep. The thing that that's going to, you're going to need to do is learn, iterate, improve, and go through that cycle. The faster you can go through that cycle, the more, the more chance you have of succeeding in doing it, right? If you can, even if you could do it once, you might not be able, you're not going to be able to maintain it. Right. Uh, and that's where Digital Rebar comes in. Um, and what we've been doing with Digital Rebar is actually building that up. And I have some slides that, that support that. Um, but this is the type of hybrid infrastructure that we're talking about building. Um, I love this slide just because it's right. complex. Go ahead. Did you want to say something on it? No, no. This is exactly actually it kind of is a logical plus physical slide kind of combined. So if you look at it, you have the blue site, which is on premises, which could be VM as well as bare metal. And same for the public cloud, because you have soft layers of the world, which provides you the bare metal servers, right? Now, on the top of it, you use digital rebar to build these clusters. And the clusters come alive with Contrail built into it. And now you use the Contrail capability to create all these virtual networks on the top, which include service chaining, as well as policy-based interconnect between virtual networks. So the combination makes the whole thing pretty powerful. Because you can typically put in the people who have done enterprise networking, they know that the network segmentation is a very prime need for all enterprise network because you have to put firewalls there, you have to capture logs, and it gets pretty complex. And you can get all those features turned on by Contrail when it gets built by Digital Rebar. Makes sense. Okay. Um. And this is a little bit, you, you probably want to, you might want to drill in on this. So this is the right. same, this is the top layer, if you will, of that. Um, it's probably worth describing some of, of the Right, components. and so we talk about uh, overlay network, and this is a quick slide uh, to show what overlay network actually means. So essentially, on the bottom side, you see a physical environment where you have the hypervisor with VMs or containers sitting on the top of it with uh, V routers sitting there. And on the other side, you have a similar V router sitting on the other side. Now, what Overlay Network does is essentially using the control plane that Contrail has, it understands the endpoint, encapsulates the traffic to the endpoint with whatever information is needed in the header, and then it essentially it kind of delivers it over a pure IP network. So you don't have to redo your IP network, put L2 domains into it, and uh, do all the interesting stuff in the underlay. So it is completely underlay agnostic, and you pretty much have whatever you have on the top here, which is uh, if you have three separate networks, you connect it through a policy, which is part of Contrail. Or you can do service chaining, which connects the blue network and the yellow network with a virtualized firewall. Or it could be a bump in the wire, IPS, IDS service. So all those capabilities kind of come together. I'll, I'll pause for questions. Right? Yeah. This, is, this is a challenge to do in part because every time you add a new component for their, your infrastructure, the infrastructure needs to be aware of what's in the infrastructure. So there's a circular cluster. It's, a, it's like building a cluster, right? When you build a cluster, you don't get to randomly have things show up in it. You actually have to know what the scope of that cluster is and coordinate those activities. So it's not just, uh, you know, oh, I added a couple more servers in and things just magically work. You, uh, you do actually need to coordinate those activities so that you build that, that the extent of your network. Does that make sense? This is one of the things that if, if you've tried to build um, any of the networking technologies, you know, one of the things that makes it really hard is understanding how those bridges work and the routers and, and all the networking topologies. It's, it's the significant challenge is not necessarily making the software work. <laughs> the software does what it needs to do. It's configuring all the pieces so that it has the data to work correctly. Okay. Right. Yep, to, to just to add to it, like yeah. if you have a physical network firewall that is sitting in there, 
and the corporate policy is to take all the traffic and make it go through that physical appliance, then redoing the entire underlay infrastructure and putting all the VLANs and making sure all the traffic goes through the uh, whatever physical appliance you have is pretty hard. And whatever agility you have in your cloud kind of goes out of the window the moment you try to do it in a quicker way. So that's right. where it all comes together. This, this is part of the... Um, uh, we have a couple more slides to go. I'll, I'm mm. going to pause for a second. Sure. Um, but part of the, the apply, rinse, repeat, the, the title of this talk, and we'll, we'll, we're, gonna, we're still building on that to an extent or through it, is that none of these configurations are going to work the first time. And this, is, this has been something that, that I know from having done deployments and trying to help people do deployments. If you start with the idea that you're going to know the extents and bounds of your deployment and get it right because you wrote it all down, you're, you're going to find that that's, that's a very hard way to do a deployment. It, it, you're, you will always find things in doing a deployment that you didn't realize were in, in process or in situ or on the site. And the, the number one thing number one piece of advice I give in any deployment is be prepared to s iterate, iterate, iterate. And the faster you can turn through that, the more likely you are going to be for it to be successful, right? If you show up thinking, oh, I'm going to install the servers and get it right the first time and, and, and plumb my networks and get it right the first time, you don't budget for a, a, a going back and tuning it and tuning it and tuning it, then, you know, right. You're going to be in trouble. You're going to discover firewall rules <laughs> and, and lack of ports open. And like that. Right, you want exactly. to talk to this slide too? Uh, sure, sure. So essentially, uh, like if you look at a modern day infrastructure that we are kind of looking at, you have the on-premise resource pool. By resource pool, I mean there is storage and CPU and whatnot. And then you have the public resource pool. Now, the, the type of computers that you have there are containers and pods, and then you have bare metal, then you have virtual machines. And then each of them could be running different applications on it, or it could be running applications from different tenant, right? Now, if you want to bring them together in separate network segments, which is the, the top rack there, where each tenant actually has one or more virtual network that is actually holding them together and making the interaction work with each other inside that virtual network. So it, it is a complex problem, and we cannot trivialize it or belittle it. And that's where you have to go through the iterative process, and that's where digital reward becomes really important, where you can make it learn, and at one time you reach it. And more so, like think of dev and staging and POC, everything spread around all of them. So it kind of becomes really, really important and complex. Right. Or orchestration is really not an optional thing at any level of this, this orchestration. If you're going to build this type of infrastructure, you have to have the right sequence of events. You have to be able to repeat them. You have to be able to span different data, different elements of your infrastructure and say, all right, I'm going to talk to my controller. Now I'm going to talk to my DNS server. Now I'm going to talk to my actual node, right? So it's, it's a very much a coordination exercise. And this is one of the things that leads to the fidelity gap. If I'm doing a development system and I've got two, si two machines, I don't even think about the fact that I'm tweaking one than the other or I'm on my laptop and I'm like, yeah, I always have to kick this, this action or repeat it or do these in the right sequence because I'm, I'm just developing and so I know those steps. If you're going to do a 100 node deployment, it all of a sudden becomes much more meaningful if the nodes boot out of order or I, or I bring up the NICs in the wrong sequence or I don't put my IPs in correctly. So those, those elements, the re repetition here is that you can actually orchestrate things repeatedly and then do it in smaller scale. Because what, what we're really talking about being able to do is get things in the right sequence. Just looking at, I mean, this is a simplified version of it. But if I was going to build this infrastructure, I would actually have to go through and do it in the correct sequence. So Kubernetes, if your Kubernetes uses etcd as a database, that etcd has to be built into a cluster if you're going to do HA. And then when you go turn on <laughs> the Kubernetes infrastructure, part of what you have to do is plumb in the networking. Plumbing in the networking means actually doing a kernel patch, getting that applied. Then you have to re tell Kubernetes to use the networking. Every time you bring up a new container, you have to crosstalk and tell that container which network to use and then identify the, the network traffic maps from each container coming up into the infrastructure. Right? It's a ton of work. Some of that's handled by Kubernetes, thank goodness. <laughs> but all of those steps have to be done in, in the correct sequence repeatedly. And so what we're really talking about doing is understanding that if you want to be successful with this, you have to start automated. Right. Um, this. 
Oh, okay. Nice. Um, yeah, so, and so if you look at what this cluster is, ah, I was going to throw a demo in this. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you look at what this cluster is, um, we're back to this slide, but, and, and I wanted to spend some time on this uh, in Q&A, but you know, it's, it's multiple clusters, it's multiple pieces, all of these things trying to work together and, and build this connected infrastructure. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So pretty much that is the last slide. Right. And we have we, are, we have some more. We're doing great on time. So we have okay. some time for. We have a lot of time for Q and A, and I have a microphone for it. Um, and these are links to more more information. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, we we wanted to not overwhelm you with technical details. We could have. We actually. I think the first pass of this deck right. was uh, tutorials on Kubernetes, tutorials on digital rebar tutorials on Juniper and, and uh, up in Contrail, and we thought we'd leave it for questions to figure out what the audience wanted to hear from that perspective. Right. Questions? How many, how many people have seen Kubernetes and, and how Kubernetes operates? Would, would people be interested in hearing a little bit more about what Kubernetes does and, and what the architecture looks like for Kubernetes? Is that a, yes? Um, all right, that's, that's me. Wow. So Kubernetes, <laughs> Kubernetes uses Docker. Uh, and then, so the, the thing with, with Kubernetes is that its job is to take individual Docker containers and build clusters from Docker containers. Okay, so what, what you have is a YAML file that describes, here is the list of containers I need to, I need to create for my, ma my application. It puts them into um, pods, which are sort of these, these tenant clusters, and then it tells you, just like in a Docker, uh, we use Docker Compose for digital rebar, it tells you map this port to it, this is how to direct traffic, this is its life cycle, this is things it's connected to. So there's a lot of information describing the application's um, architecture in that, in that file, in that, that configuration file, including where to go get the, the containers themselves, and if uh, a container changes, there's ways to go and say, oh, well, update this container to a new version and, and take care of all of sort of that housekeeping. So how many people have used Docker to actually package an application or run an application in Docker? Wow, okay. So we'll step, we'll step even, let me step back even further. That's fine. Uh, this is, I, I'm, I love having these conversations because this is, this is how we, you know, we, we, people need to understand how these things work. Um, and that's why we didn't want to dump a whole bunch of, hey, here's how Contrail <laughs> ties into, because uh, it, would, it wouldn't make much sense if we jumped at the end. So uh, the reason why Docker is really interesting is um, there's a couple of reasons. But what Docker is going to do is it's going to create a portable operating operational environment so you can install your application uh, the way you want. So all the packaging, installs, configuration, pieces like that. And then the infrastructure like Kubernetes is going to start that, app, that container up and then expose it to the network. So a, a Docker by itself, you can put things in it, you can start them, and then you can play with the application. It's pretty handy as an individual thing. No applications run as individual things. They, they run in concert with other services. And a lot of what, the, what you'll hear with Docker development patterns is microservices. So you're really taking a, your, the, your big application and breaking it into lots and lots of small pieces. And then those small pieces, you need to coordinate their activities so that if my app, so actually I'll go back, let me go up to Rebar and explain it. So if, if my application needs these services, then that will translate into actually building the full application. So you, you, you decompose your application, then Kubernetes helps you build that application back up. Digital Rebar uses Compose, which is sort of like a, a lightweight version of Kubernetes. So we have to bootstrap. So we install Kubernetes, it's not there yet. So we have to bootstrap with Compose. What, what we've done in Digital Rebar is we actually took a full data center provisioning architecture and collapsed it into, it's about 12 containers. So that means that our, the Digital Rebar application itself has a web server, it has an um, orchestration engine, it has a database server, and it uses something called Console, which is a service registration bus, a service registration uh, distributed lock manager is what we're calling it at, in OpenStack world right now. Um, so it, it needs those things to run, and then to run a data center, you need DNS and DHCP and a provisioner. You need a, um, 
uh, half dozen services to actually run your data center, right? You can't, you know, you, those are the, the minimum sets, right? I have, need a time synchronization in names and I have to have a way to install an o OS. So what Digital Rebar does is it'll bring up containers with all of those services in it. And then because we're using Compose, it actually brings them up in the right services and then console connects all those pieces together. Um, I'm not in a position to crank up a demo that fast. There's, I have some videos online you can watch how this stuff works. But literally what happens is we bring up all of these containers and then they register with each other and then we wire all that work together. So when you boot, it, when you boot up a new physical infrastructure or a VM or attach something from the cloud, it comes in and says, okay, I know who you are. And then it starts putting you through the paces of all the data center infrastructure. The fact that we do that in an automated way means that you now have the base, you have to start at the base, to start doing a f automated provisioning of all the pieces. So you can say, oh, I know how to SSH into this, I know how to install Docker, I know how to install Kubernetes. I, when I, first I have to, before I can install Kubernetes, I have to build an etcd cluster, then I have to install the master infrastructure, then I have to, and then you need DNS entries for those, so you can build HA clusters, and then you have to build the minions, which attach to the mass. So you have to do all this work in sequence. If I'm going to test my uh, open contrail networking on top of that, which is right. what we're doing, then you actually have to inject open contrail steps in the middle of those sequences. So when I'm sitting testing uh, open contrail Kubernetes deployments, I'm going to go through that, that cycle a hundred times, and the sequence matters. I'm going to spend a lot more time testing the sequence than I want to test installing the operating system or the RAID or BIOS. Or, you know, we do all that stuff. It's, it, it's, work, it's reliable. What we're doing in building Kubernetes deployments is we're learning how to make all that stuff work. So we're doing that so you can start, but then you're going to show up on your site, and you're going to say, oh, you know what, my, my IT department mm -hmm. says I have to integrate through the firewall. And that means these network rules are this. And I want to do some work in Amazon, and that means I have to have these paths to the internet. Those variations are going, you know, you're not going to know what, how to fix them the first time. It's going to take you learnings to do it. So the whole infrastructure is designed to then go through and say, all right, this didn't work. Tear it all down. Go through and do it again. And the, the thing that we're, that we're showing here is that you're, you're literally building up all these little services, wiring them together. And you take the next level, build a whole bunch of servers and services and wire them together. That's the, that's the design pattern that we're talking about. Um, and for us, the thing that was really fun to me is when we, when we uh, rebranded to Digital Rebar, we also switched to this microservices approach where we're literally, that, that services-oriented mentality goes all the way down to the very fabric of, of how things are structured. Okay. Oh, here's the console pieces. So that's so Kubernetes is taking that same approach. It does it for your application. If you want to build an application that uses Kubernetes, you're going to take your, your bigger application and break it into smaller, uh, pro really progressively smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and that's something that people experiment their way through. Um, but what's nice is that you can say Kubernetes keeps something at you know, 10 nodes of scale capacity and it'll, it'll make sure that if a server dies, it'll bring up another couple nodes. Do you want to talk about the integration? Sure, sure, yeah, let me, let me talk about using the same slide. So essentially in Kubernetes, you have the concept of pods and each pod has multiple okay, containers sure inside it. and... Is that better? Uh, yeah, we can okay. go from there. So uh, now where Contrail comes in is uh, you can take a pod and give it and put it as a part of a virtual network and each pod is going to give a complete specific IP address with the IPAM that Contrail enables and essentially a set of pod would be a separate virtual network that now you can use to connect it to a VPC in AWS or make sure that the traffic coming to that virtual network or coming out of that virtual network goes through a set of firewall, be it virtualized firewall, be it uh, uh, appliance, uh, hardware firewall, and all those iterate, the, and you are going to find those out partly when you, when you are trying to design the service and partly when you are actually trying to run the service. So all the flexibilities are not obvious up front so now you create it, and now maybe you figure out that, hey, you need uh, three more virtual networks because there are three more policy level we have no idea. And this three more policy level is actually dictated by the operator of the I, who runs IT. And they say that, you know what? This particular service has to go through IPS scrubbing. 
and now suddenly you cannot redo the entire thing. You needed a capability where you can bring in the dynamic way of putting all those pods in a separate virtual network and make it go through a different service chain, right? So those are the capabilities that get enabled with Contrail. So I want to highlight what pods are right. a little bit. Okay. Um, so, and, and I think you and I are both add different things to this <laughs> definition. Uh -huh. it's, it's, fundamentally, it's pretty simple. If I'm bringing up an application, Kubernetes is going to put it, put my application into a pod. So it's, it's a domain boundary. What, what we're saying is that in that pod, the networking is, is going to appear as if all of the networking is local within that pod, even if it's distributed, right? Kubernetes is going to provide that capability because that it's, it's, uh, it's technology out of Google, but it basically makes the assumption that if I have a pod, all of the elements within the pod can talk to each other. And if I want to now have a pod that spans layer two boundaries or data centers, now I've got to deal with external rules, which right. is what you were describing. Right. 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 So, so if you can imagine, you know, I've got I want a pod that spans Amazon and private infrastructure, or an OpenStack cloud and private infrastructure, then that's going to go through a firewall, which mm -hmm. means your IT department's going to actually care about that route. And so you need something that actually builds that route. And it's not per persistent route. It's not a VLAN. When that pod is created, you're actually, and every container is attached to it, you actually have to build the networking between that pod, that, that container right. and the other containers in the pod. Right. It's, it's that dynamic, right? So I... I say, oh, I want a Kubernetes scale up. It adds 50 containers. Those 50 containers go up on 10 different hosts, maybe in two different data centers. Mm -hmm. those, those network connections actually get built for you dynamically so that you now have built this infrastructure. That's, I mean, this is complex stuff. Um, but once you've built it, it's really powerful. Right. Go ahead. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, just to mm -hmm. dig a little deeper into how ah. Kubernetes handles pods and um, the nodes, so you have the cube minions that was mentioned there. Now, a uh, node is basically a single server or a single VM, which has a single IP address from the infrastructure. But that can have n number of pods inside it. And now in the, in the simpler way of handling the networking, people have provided a separate overlay private address space for each of this uh, cube minions or cube nodes. And now all the pods ends up getting an IP address from that particular block. Now, you are in a situation where you cannot um, actually impose a network segment in that kind of situation. Because in the IT world, each of the pod needs to be part of a different network segment so you can make it go through a different policy chain. Because that's what uh, IT and enterprise uh, lives through. And uh, of course, in some multi-tenant uh, cloud infrastructure, they have the same, same uh, implications and same kind of boundary implications. So that's where a single IP address of a node and getting translated into multiple disparate IPs of each of the pod. And then that's where you need an overlay layer, which is smart enough to provide a pod a particular IP based on where it belongs to. And what we do inside Kubernetes is we use the label concept inside Kubernetes. And you can give a name. It's a key value pair. You give a name and give whatever unique name. And that becomes a virtual network. And essentially, you get an IP address from that virtual network. Right. Right. So if that sounds complicated, it is. <laughs> I, I, it is. The, the thing that, that we're advocating here, because we think it also is incredibly valuable to build this type of infrastructure, what we found is if you want to be successful doing that in production, which is where everybody should want to be successful, the closer you can get to doing that in your development environments and your testing environments, the more successful you'll be, right? You're going to find out these issues. You're going to build it. So what we, what we don't want to see people do you can do it if you want. I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll pat you on the back when it when it hurts. What, what we what we think that is is not good is if you start and do development and you're using Kubernetes, yay, but you're doing it in an environment that doesn't have robust networking. You're you're not going to find issues in your application deployment until you get into the next cascade over the next cascade over. And so what we're really trying to do is make sure that you can do real deployments in very small environments and then grow them gracefully up so you start that learning process and you actually get into the, the cycle. Because what you don't want to do, so I'll step back, the, the value proposition for Docker and Kubernetes and this type of, of model is that 
your, your development environment is as close to production as you can make it. That's one of the big things that people like about Docker. I've packaged my application. It's immutable. It's going to translate all the way through into production. That, will, that falls down if, you're, if, you're then to, you know, if your test environment, your, your dev environments are not true enough to production that the networking breaks when you go between those environments, right? That, that would be a failure, right? That, that breaks the whole model. So we're trying to make it so you can, you can get really small in these infrastructures, and then when they go to production, you can actually have that faithful experience of, of all the way through. That's, right. That's where the fidelity concept comes from. Okay, and we're just about out of time, I yeah, think. Maybe we should open it up for questions. Any last questions? We've been sort of taking hand polls for questions, but... No, everybody's ready for happy hour and closing the summit down? Yeah, we are I'm in favor the of happy that. hour. I'm in favor of that. <laughs> yeah. I th thank you all. We're, we're going to upload these slides. Um, I'm I'll, I'll, I'll tweet them um, and post them out of, out of uh, oh, it doesn't have my Twitter handle. So I'm Zeekel online. Just you can look for that and we'll, you, you'll, these will be off my uh, slide share. So. Yeah. <laughs> for a purpose. <laughs> 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 when the signal to noise ratio changes, maybe I will. <laughs> S spoken like a network person. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I, and this is closing, so if I hope you had a great summit. Um, wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you.